Basil II, the Bulgar Slayer, Part 5, Eastern Acquisitions, Italian Dreams, and Legacy, 1018-1025 CE. By 1018, Basil had completed his life's work, the conquest of the Bulgarian Empire. He was now free to devote the remainder of his life to other endeavors. Aside from continuing to oversee the integration of Bulgaria, Basil and his magnificent army could now pursue other, thankfully easier, opportunities for conquest. Having put the East on the back burner for the last 20 years, Basil II returned and brought Byzantine fortunes to their absolute apogee. He did this through a combination of bold action and shrewd, disciplined diplomatic maneuvering. After making significant advances in the East, Basil turned his gaze westward to Italy, Byzantium's perpetual tertiary theater of operations. The brilliant Catapano of Italy, Basil Boioannis, achieved great success and set the stage for an expansion of imperial power in the West. Wishing to join the most talented subordinate who had emerged over the course of his half-century imperial career, Basil II began to prepare a massive expedition aiming for nothing less than the conquest of Sicily. However, age and the strain of decades of hard campaigning had taken their toll on the 67-year-old ruler, and he died in Constantinople, deprived of the chance to add to his illustrious career by conquering Sicily. It was only ten days before Christmas in 1025. Once dead, it soon became apparent both that Basil II was the greatest ruler Byzantium had ever had, and also that the Bulgar Slayer should have devoted more of his prodigious energy into making sure that his line of succession was secure. At the conclusion of this video, I will consider Basil's accomplishments, legacy, and how he shaped the Empire's future. To a certain extent, the years 1018 to 1025 are something of a bonus stage for Basil II. At this point, he had accomplished his life's work, and he was more or less just trying to burnish his resume and expand the empire as opportunities arose. It took him a few years to really find his major project, and as I alluded to earlier, that major project didn't quite come together due to him running out of time. His immediate response to being freed up from his Bulgarian enterprise was to look back to the east. Despite the acquisition of Bulgaria, the fact remained that most of the empire's manpower and financial resources were in the east. This was still the heartland of the Byzantine Empire. And Basil had neglected it for the last 20 or so years. Luckily for him, not only was this the area that he most needed to defend, but the enemies that he faced were relatively weak. None of them were anywhere nearly as cunning as Tsar Samuel of Bulgaria had been, and also, none of the armies that he would face were anywhere nearly so resilient as the armies of Bulgaria. By and large, even with fairly thin resources at their disposal, Basil's generals had been able to hold the line ably enough. There had been some instances of minor regression, but for the most part, the frontier had held quite well. There were two potential enemies that he faced in the east. One was the Fatimid Caliphate, a foe that he was very familiar with, and the other was a new ruler named Georgie I, who was the ruler of Abkhazia. Georgie was a relative of David of Tal, the man who had bequeathed his realm to Basil a few decades earlier, and as such, Georgie was trying to press his claim on Upper Tal. In fact, while Basil was preoccupied fighting the Bulgarians, a young Georgie had taken advantage of Basil's distraction to occupy some of Byzantium's new eastern territory. At the same time, Armenia, an allied kingdom, was tottering, and unbeknownst to Basil, there was also some hidden discontent among the Anatolian military aristocracy. In 1021, Basil will officially re-enter the east with his full army, and he would remain there until early 1023. During this relatively brief period of time, he would manage to address all of the problems that I have laid out before you. Let's begin by looking at the rise of Georgie I. In an earlier episode, I believe it was episode 2, 
I looked at Basil's first Eastern campaign where he managed to annex Upper Tau from David of Tau. Basil had recognized the right of Bagrat III, one of David of Tau's kinsmen, to inherit from David upon his death. Bagrat had previously been set up by David to unite Abkhazia, Kartli, and Tau. Of course, this arrangement didn't quite take place because of David having to give away so much territory to Byzantium. However, Bagrat III did inherit parts of all of those things, but then he passed away in 1014. At that point, Basil II thinks that the obligation that he had to honor David's last will and testament is now gone, so he wants to get back all of the parts of Upper Tau that he had allowed Bagrat to rule. At the same time, however, in 1014, the ambitious young Georgie I came to power, and needless to say, he had alternative ideas about how this should work. When Basil asked for David's old land back, the teenage Georgie decided to respond, not with envoys, but with an invasion of Upper Tau. He won a battle over Byzantine forces there, and he occupied some territory. It's not exactly clear how much land he was occupying, but it was a substantial enough amount of land to get Basil's attention, but not enough to cause him to send reinforcements to the area. By this point, it is getting to be about the time of Clydean, and Basil has Bulgaria on the ropes, so he's got bigger fish to fry. However, when he comes back east, he is very mindful of Georgie's activities, and he's looking to get even. He also learns, as he's marching through Anatolia, that Georgie was negotiating an alliance with the Fatimids, led by Caliph al-Hakim, and perhaps he was working with others, as Basil would come to suspect later when he began to hear about discontent within his own ranks. Caliph al-Hakim of the Fatimids came to power in 996 and ruled until 1021. Al-Hakim was famously erratic and fairly unpopular with his own officers. He did, however, entertain northern ambitions. He wanted to push back the Byzantines and claim some of their territory. It's unclear exactly how far his ambitions extended, but I don't think it would be too unreasonable for him to dream of adding the Emirate of Aleppo and then perhaps acquiring Antioch as well, something along those lines. Al-Hakim was a guy who changed his mind quite a bit and who acted on the spur of the moment without really thinking things through. He persecuted Christians at one point, and rather than continuing to persecute them, he instead allowed them to leave for Byzantium between 1013 and 1015. Many of these Christians were then resettled throughout the empire. This ended up working out okay. At the same time, however, Basil had an ongoing embargo against trading with the Fatimids, and this continued throughout this period, although as we can see, the two empires were not at war, and Basil received the refugees from the Fatimids. So it was a very tense relationship, but not necessarily one which was unstable. The Fatimids were focused on Aleppo. Without Basil's personal attention in the east, the Byzantines had a more defensive mindset in the south, so they were not willing to march to the rescue of Aleppo. This is by express order of Basil himself. Some of his generals were much more willing to get involved, but Basil continuously ordered them not to. Even though the Fatimids acquired Aleppo in 1017, the general of the north who had pulled this off, a man named Fatik, soon rebelled, and now there was something of a civil war. Fatik, for his part, probably thought that al-Hakim was going to have him killed on a whim, so that is where being erratic gets you sometimes. In 1021, while Basil was marching through Asia Minor, he learned that al-Hakim had died in February, or at least people assume that he died. The circumstances of al-Hakim's end days are fascinating and mysterious. So al-Hakim had many habits that were eccentric, and one of them was to dress up as a common person and disappear into the night, sometimes be gone for 
the whole night or a couple days or whatever it might be and then come back to the palace. Well, in February, he happened to just leave and he never came back. So people assumed he was dead and the caliphate moved on. He might not have died, of course. We don't really know what happened. And since YouTube seems to have been taken over by true crime, why not a cold case investigation of Al-Hakim? I want to know what happened. What Did Al-Hakim have a second life? I need to know. But the upshot of Al-Hakim's disappearance is that the Fatimids became much less of a threat as they were now deeply disorganized. Uh, it's worth noting also that Al-Hakim had managed to deal with Batik's rebellion by this point. But what it did do is make sure that Basil was free to campaign in the north without having to worry about the south. There is some debate among scholars as to what his intentions were in this campaign, and the sources don't reveal whether he intended to go after the Fatimids first or against Georgie first. My suspicion is he intended to go against Georgie, since Georgie had trespassed to a much, much greater degree than had the Fatimids. But at any rate, it is interesting to speculate about what happened to Al-Hakim and what would have occurred had he still been around. We already know that the Fatimids managed to acquire Aleppo, but let's revisit Aleppo's history after Basil's departure around the year 1000, so that way we can get caught up to the present. The emirate was in decline under the Hamdanids, and Basil was willing to monitor the situation from the sidelines. A civil war broke out among the Hamdanids, but it was of no interest to Basil. His generals were asked to intervene by various contestants, and they were forced to decline because Basil oversaw all of their decisions. They were eventually overthrown in 1008, and this led to more infighting and interventions from the Fatimids, which eventually led to the aforementioned acquisition of Aleppo by the Fatimids. By 1025, there had been no further Byzantine intervention. However, the Fatimid presence had fallen away after the death of Al-Hakim, and the emirate was independent once again under a new dynasty, the Murdasids, who were significantly weaker than the Hamdanids had been. So, for Byzantium, this was a fairly ideal outcome. They still had a buffer between themselves and the Fatimids, and this buffer was absolutely no threat. So, Basil's decision to stay out of things and to play it quiet paid out in dividends. Before turning north to deal with the recalcitrant Georgie, Basil decided to make a detour to Vasperikon. This was a small Armenian kingdom on his border, which had been a buffer state between himself and the emirates of the east. The king of Vespurikan, Sennacherim, had decided to offer his kingdom up to Basil in exchange for land, money, and a court title. Basically the same deal that other previous rulers had made with Basil. The reason why Sennacherim was willing to give up his kingdom and become a Byzantine subject is because he was getting hammered by Turks from the east, and he thought that the best chance of survival for his people was if he submitted to the empire and got the protection of the imperial army. This marks the beginning, so far as I'm aware, of Byzantium's long history with the Turks. Basil appointed a new Katapano to control Vasperikon, but his first appointee did so poorly that Basil was forced to replace him within a year with a man named Nicephorus Komnenos, who is the first known member of the Komnenoi the future dynasty of Byzantium. So here we see that not only do we have the first instance of the Turks emerging in Byzantine history, but also the first emergence of the Komnenoi. It's an interesting event, to be sure. Having acquired a small kingdom for just appearing, Basil now turns north to take back the parts of Upper Tal that Georgie I was occupying. He first massed on Georgie's border and tried to resolve the dispute through diplomacy. He sent envoys, but Georgie rebuffed his efforts at reconciliation. We now have something of a source divergence. 
The Caucasian sources claim that Basil was able to defeat Georgie in a major battle, but the Byzantine sources say that Georgie simply retreated behind a river that Basil could not cross, and that that was effectively the campaign. Both accounts are in agreement, however, that once Georgie was out of the way, Basil retaliated by laying waste to the land and then blinding prisoners by the thousands. Apparently, this practice was something that he enjoyed or at least thought was effective, so he brought it from the Bulgarian War to the East. This must have been something of a shock to Georgie and his subjects. He then retreated in the friendly territory and began to plan his 1022 campaign where he would go back against Georgie and finish the job. However, things were about to get a little bit more complicated than Basil had envisioned. Since the time of the Slavic migration and the Arab invasions, the real heartland of the Byzantine Empire had been Cappadocia. This had been the frontier that had held out against the advances of the Arabs from the east, and this is where the great families of Byzantium had established themselves and their great estates. So this was not only the heartland of Byzantine power, but also the heartland of the army. It's a place where any Byzantine emperor should feel safe passing the winter, but it was not to be in 1021-22. Nicephorus Xiphias, who had previously been one of Basil's best generals, he was, after all, the hero of Clydean, the general who'd slipped behind Samuel to cause the great massacre at Clydean, was serving as Strategus of the Anatolican theme, and he convinced another leading member of the aristocracy, Nicephorus Phocas, the son of the rebel Bardas Phocas, who himself was, of course, a relative of the earlier emperor Nicephorus II Phocas, to join him in a revolt against Basil II. This particular Phocas had not really done anything politically, because, obviously, Basil, who had grown up under the tutelage of his great-uncle, in this case, was suspicious of members of the Phocas family, the name Phocas still carried a great deal of weight with the other members of the Anatolian military aristocracy, and because the name Nicephorus Phocas resonated so much, this revolt quickly centered around Phocas rather than Xiphias. For Xiphias, this was deeply obnoxious, as he had accomplished a great deal more than had Phocas. But we have to remember, Nicephorus Xiphias was a newcomer. He was one of the newer Western aristocrats. He was not accepted as being socially on par with the older established families of the East. So he was quickly kind of cast into a subordinate role, and without his leadership and generalship, of course, this mutiny or revolt or whatever you want to call it, didn't have a great chance of success. They also failed to attract any mass support. People tend to stick with rulers who are successful. And the revolt as a whole lost any real chance of success when Phocas suddenly died on August 15th, 1022. Xiphias was then arrested and forced to become a monk, thus ending what should have been a very illustrious career. Instead, his fame ended in disgrace. So, Xiphias ultimately ended up as a villain after having been one of the greatest heroes in the Empire's recent history. So, you might be wondering... Why would anyone revolt against Basil II, who was at the height of his power? This man had just conquered the Bulgarian Empire. The army was deeply loyal to him. He had his Varangians on hand. What kind of a madman would attempt something of this nature? Well, there is the possibility that Xiphias and Phocas were in league with Georgie I. That's something that Basil II himself believed, but we do have to keep in mind that Basil was a somewhat paranoid guy, especially after the experiences of his youth, when he had had to deal with the aristocracy, and before that when he had seen the two usurpers, Nicephorus II and John I Zemiskis. So, Basil tended to be suspicious of everyone around him, and to see conspiracies whether they existed in actuality or not. He tended to err on the side of caution. 
And although Basil II had been wildly successful and was deeply popular, especially with the army, we have to keep in mind something about Basil's life. He was over 60 years old, but he had never been married, and he had never sired any offspring. His brother was his heir apparent, but his brother wasn't much younger and only had three daughters. These three daughters themselves were unmarried, and they were getting to the point where they would soon be out of their childbearing years. For Xiphias, who was an accomplished general, he could look back on the whole of Roman and Byzantine history and see that for someone like himself, there was an opportunity. He was a highly successful general, he was popular with the men, and maybe the opportunity seemed to call out to him. But of course, it was not to be, largely because the military aristocracy was perfectly content with Basil, by and large, and the ones who weren't wanted to throw in their lot with the Focates. I don't think Xiphias was necessarily a fool for attempting the revolt, but as a Western aristocrat, he failed to anticipate the prejudice that the Anatolian aristocracy had for the newfangled Western aristocracy. For them, the Battle of Clydean was nice and all, but it didn't give him a pedigree or a right to rule. Basil was surprisingly lenient towards Xiphias. He let the man live and become a monk. We don't have any evidence that he had him blinded, something that he tended to do to a lot of people. When it came to Phocas, however, he was not terribly kind to the man's body. He had Phocas's head removed and then sent to Georgie while he geared up for another campaign in the north. The implication of Phocas's head, of course, is that his head was severed because he had acted in league with Georgie. Basil started this campaign late in the season in 1022, and he intended to finish it quickly if possible. He wanted to retake the forts that David had given to Bagrat, and he demanded that Georgie sur uh, surrender all of them. In the meantime, he was besieging the ones within reach. Georgie, who was woefully outmatched by Basil, agreed to his terms, but he had ulterior motives, and he was hoping for an opening which would allow him to reverse things and turn the tables. I get the distinct impression that Georgie had a very cursory understanding of the Bulgarian War. The Bulgarians famously relied upon ambush because their army was less heavy than the Byzantine army, and this was the advantage that they needed to gain great victories. As such, Basil had fallen prey to an ambush at Trajan's Gate, and since that point he had become an extremely cautious commander who was an expert at scouting and avoiding ambushes. So, if you're trying to defeat Basil using an ambush, it's probably not the best idea, since that is the thing that he is most likely to look for. And indeed, Georgie's attempt to ambush Basil failed horribly because Basil detected the ambush, turned the tables, and this led to a great slaughter of Georgie's men sometime in the fall of 1022. Basil was able to not only defeat Georgie's army in detail, but also to seize the royal treasury, and after the battle, he basically stacked up the severed heads of Georgie's fallen soldiers. This is what Sean would call a skull pyramid. Basil II only retook the forts that he had originally demanded, so he did not take advantage of this unexpected windfall victory, and he also demanded hostages to make sure that Georgie behaved himself. The hostages included Georgie's son, Bagrat. Basil did honor the agreement to the letter, and not all that long before his death in 1025, Basil released all of the hostages. Basil was surprisingly generous towards Georgie, given that he thought Georgie was behind the mutiny, and it's pretty amazing that he didn't try to penalize Georgie further. Perhaps he thought that this was as far as Byzantium could spread in this direction at this time. At any rate, it is fascinating. And this was the last great military victory that Basil II will command in person. By early January of 1023, Basil II was back at Constantinople, and he immediately began to cast about for new opportunities to gain glory and campaign against the enemies of Byzantium. He cast his gaze upon Italy, 
This was the permanent tertiary theater of operations for the empire. Ever since the 6th century, when Byzantium had conquered Italy, it had been something of a sideshow. However, in recent years, Byzantine fortunes there had been quite good. Their hold on the south of Italy was firm, even if they were under the threat of constant raids from Arab-controlled Sicily, and also from Lombard invasions and revolts, and from the Holy Roman Empire. Yet, things were pretty sound in 1023, and Basil began to look at Italy hopefully as a place where there was abundant opportunity for Byzantine expansion. Much of this, as we'll see, was due to the excellent generalship of his Catapano, Basil Boianis. Also in early 1023, as he's beginning to look west, Basil is also looking for conspirators who might have been involved in the Cappadocian Revolt. He managed to arrest and eliminate some men he suspected as plotters, and with that done, he is now able to really start to plan an Italian operation. Italy really looked like a place replete with great opportunities. Otto III was gone, and Italy hadn't been this quiet since the time of Otto II's death around 984. Let's look at how Italy came to this state of affairs before we look at Basil's planned campaign and the end of his long reign. Emperor Otto III had a Byzantine mother, and he aspired to marry a Byzantine princess from the Macedonian dynasty, one of the daughters of Constantine VIII. As such, Philogathus visited him from the court at Constantinople, and the two men began to negotiate a marriage alliance between young Otto and one of Basil's nieces. While he was in Rome, Philogathus became involved in the politics of the papacy. He was there when the bishops deposed Otto's cousin Gregory V, and himself took over as Pope for ten months as John XVI. Exactly how he was accepted by the Catholics of the West is unclear, but perhaps they thought that by putting Philogathus on the papal throne, this would gain the support of Basil II. It doesn't matter if it did, and actually we don't know if it did or not, because Otto III deposed and mutilated Philogathus, and this ended his brief papacy without really damaging relations between the Empire and Byzantium. Neither Otto III nor the Byzantines engaged in any offensive action against the other, and there were no formal protests over Philogathus' death. Apparently, Basil looked at this as something of an embarrassment since his envoy had failed to do his duty and had gone rogue. The marriage proceeded as planned. Either Zoe or Theodora, we're not sure which one, arrived at Bari in January of 1002, only to find that the most recent news on the streets was that Otto III had suddenly died. The princess went home to Byzantium and did not marry, thus becoming an old maid. Let us look back at some of the other developments in the West in order to get up to the present, which in this case is the year 1023. Back in 992, Basil II had negotiated for the Venetians to enjoy greater trade privileges. He had negotiated with Doge Orseolo II, who ruled from 991 to 1005, and the deal was that in exchange for the Venetians having greater access to Byzantium's ports, the Venetians would use their fleet to help ferry imperial troops across the Adriatic. At this time, the Byzantines were moving forces back and forth, and also moving officials, and they didn't really have much of a naval presence in the Adriatic, so the Venetians were able to supply that. As for the Venetians, this was greatly beneficial because they were moving a lot of their commercial interests to the east. A lot of their overland trade that they had relied upon before was being greatly disrupted by the migration of the Magyars. Byzantium, of course, also benefited as their troops were now being ferried about, and the Venetians proved to be a capable and reliable ally, at least at this time. 
the Venetians stepped in to relieve the siege of Bari by the Arabs in 1002. And so, in the early days at least, this alliance was mutually beneficial, and both sides prospered from it to a great extent. The Byzantines very much saw the Venetians as a satellite of the empire, whereas the Venetians, for their part, saw themselves as something more. This conflict, of course, would come to a head in due time, but not until many, many years after Basil was dead. Although the Byzantine border in Italy was relatively secure, most of the threat to the existence of the Cataponet came from internal revolts by Lombard subjects. The Lombards managed to murder some Byzantine officials during the 980s and 990s, and this led to reprisals. The details of this are sketchy, but it is clear that when the smoke cleared, the Byzantine flag was still waving in the breeze. One Lombard notable actually attempted to let Arabs into Bari and tried to betray the city, but his plot was discovered and foiled. There were enough discontent Lombards and discontent Lombard nobles to lead them that it was inevitable there would eventually be a relatively strong challenge. All the movement needed was a strong leader, and eventually one emerged. The great leader of the Lombards in this period was a man named Milus of Bari. In later sources, fascinatingly enough, Milus is described as being both Armenian and Lombard. This could mean that he was of mixed stock, that perhaps some of the Byzantine soldiers settled in Italy were Armenian and that his heritage was mixed, or it could just be that our sources really like to attribute Armenian origins to everyone. Either way, he was the premier Lombard ruler, and he would give the Byzantines in Italy something of a headache. He was able to attract enough followers to seize control of the city of Bari in 1009, and to defeat local Byzantine forces. The Catapano of Italy at that time, a man named John Kirkawas, who was almost certainly a descendant of the much more famous John Kirkawas of the previous century, died during this revolt, and he was then replaced by Basil Argyros, the brother of the future emperor Romanos Argyros. And Basil brought with him reinforcements. In 1011, Argyros was able to retake Bari, and Milus was forced to flee, but he was not finished. And in fact, he would come back and present a stronger challenge in the future. The Catapano Basil Argyros awaited the return of Milus, but in 1016 he died, and his position was taken over by one of the Stratagoi, Contalion Tornicus. Milus, in the meantime, was able to attract the support of Pope Benedict VIII, and he w then hired some Norman mercenaries to assist him. This is, to the best of my knowledge, perhaps the earliest encounter Byzantium had with the Normans. In 1017, Tornicus engaged Milus in three separate battles, and all of them ended in something like a draw. In 1018, having read about the results of these battles, Basil II decided that Tornicus was clearly not up to the task, and he had him replaced with Basil Boioannes. Exactly what Basil Boioannes' previous career had entailed, we will never know, but he was the emperor's choice to be the new Catapano. Boioannes brought with him a contingent of Varangians and money in order to pursue the conflict against Milus. Whatever Basil II saw in the new Catapano, he made a great choice. It wouldn't take long for Boioannes to show that the emperor had been right to pick him, and also that he was in his own right one of the greatest generals Byzantium had ever produced. In October of 1018, the same year that he had taken over as Katapano, Basil Boyoani squared off against Milus at Kanai. Famously, of course, Kanai had been the site of a rather famous battle of antiquity some 1,200 years before. Milus had a strong contingent of mounted Normans under the command of a Norman nobleman. Boyoani's army is not quite known, but we do know that he had a Varangian contingent who would have been equipped pretty similarly to the Normans. 
During this battle, of which we have few details, Boioannes was completely successful, managing to slay many of the Normans, and then forcing Milas to flee to the court of Heinrich II, the new Holy Roman Emperor. The surviving Normans, the men who surrendered to Boioannes, had been won over probably by the Varangians, who would have shared enough of their language to communicate, and then entered the imperial service. They were later used to garrison the new city of Troia, where they would play a major role in creating another of Boioani's great victories. So now we have a new great general in Italy, and he will quickly make sure that Italy is fertile ground for Byzantine advancement. Having fled from the disaster at Cannae, Milus went back to Heinrich's court, where he was granted the title of Duke of Apulia. However, he was not long for this world, and he died in 1020. The Emperor Heinrich II, however, had not relinquished his ambitions of southern conquest, and he continued to make preparations for war. 1018 marked both the year when Boioannes had smashed the Lombard Revolt, and also the end of the Bulgarian War in the Balkans. This meant that imperial resources were much more abundant. More men could cross the Adriatic, and the emperor could spare more supplies and money for his Italian operations. Boioannes was, of course, a very capable commander, and now he would have abundant resources to command. This was a great situation for the Byzantines. In 1021, Duke Pandolf IV of Capua decided to recognize imperial rule and attempted to extend their control pretty close to the city of Rome itself. He offered up Milus's brother, who he had captured, and tried to join the empire. Unfortunately for Pandolf II, however, Heinrich II's invasion was about to occur. I think I just said Pandolf II, I should have said the fourth, you know what I meant. Anticipating aggression from Heinrich II, Boioannes decided to really strengthen his frontier. And his method for doing so was to fortify many sites to his north and then set up some new settlements and forts as needed to make a cohesive northern frontier which would block any major aggression from Heinrich's armies. Around the same time, Boioani seems to have captured Salerno in the south. This had possibly been held either by an independent power or by Arab raiders who might have set up a garrison there. So, one person who did get abandoned during all this was Pandolf IV, who was a little too far north for Boioani's defense scheme. Everywhere else, however, Boioani's was determined to hold. From 1021 to 1022, Heinrich mounted an invasion of Byzantine Italy using three armies. One army he commanded himself, and the other two were under the command of two different bishops. It's a fairly eccentric decision to use these bishops, but apparently the men were loyal to Heinrich, and he trusted them. Just based on the results, it does not appear that either of the bishops was a particularly good general, but to be fair, neither of them got involved in a major catastrophe, so they must not have been that bad. Aside from managing to depose Pandolf IV, who was exposed up at Capua, and managing to extract an oath of loyalty from Salerno, Heinrich and his generals weren't really able to do all that much. They weren't able to capture any of the garrison cities or to lure the much smaller army of Boioannes into an open battle. So overall, this campaign was a complete failure for Heinrich, and a brilliant success for Boioannes. Boioannes fortifications, especially the fort at Troia, where he had stationed the captured Normans, held out, including being able to repulse a number of assaults, and the invasion as a whole foundered and came to nothing. Ultimately, Heinrich decided to call off the invasion because his men began to fall ill, it is possible that he himself also suffered from illness as he died not long after this. With the Holy Roman Empire on the ropes and imperial resources flowing freely across the Adriatic, Boioannes had a pretty free field of action. His next campaign surprisingly took place in Croatia, 
he boarded his men and crossed the Adriatic to Croatia, where he managed to capture the wife and son of King Kreshimer III, and then sent them as hostages to Constantinople. Basil II was able to use this campaign to show his Venetian allies that he was a friend, since he had chastened one of their overland opponents. Anthony Caldellus believes this campaign was designed in order to ensure the cooperation, or at least non-interference, of Croatia, because Basil II wanted to have an unimpeded crossing when he himself joined his Catapano in Italy and led an invasion of the Emirate of Sicily. Yes, now it's time to talk about the plan to take over Sicily, one of the more ambitious plans that Basil II conceived. There isn't a source which lays out a clear campaign plan for Basil's invasion of Sicily. However, we can piece it together well enough to realize that this was a three-stage plan. Basil Boioannes was tasked with securing a bridgehead, and then Basil II would arrive with a larger army in 1026, and they would try to capture all of Sicily, hopefully that year. Here are my reasons for thinking that. Boioannes was securing a line of supply from Regium. He fortified the harbor and then crossed over to Messina, where he was then joined by a contingent under the Imperial General Orestes, an otherwise unknown man who was leading reinforcements. This was something like a vanguard for the overall army that Basil would bring. And in Orestes' army were Varangians and Bulgarians. I forgot to mention it earlier, but Bulgarians were now being integrated into the Byzantine army in fairly large numbers. And actually, Basil, the emperor, had used quite a number of them in his eastern campaigns against Georgie the first. However, this campaign of course came to naught because of Basil's premature death. Had Basil lived and gone on to campaign in Sicily, he would have arrived probably around March of 1026 and then the combined force would have tried to occupy the island as quickly as possible. The reason I say that is that the Emirate of Sicily was nominally a part of the Fatimid Caliphate, and they would want to conclude the campaign as quickly as possible before heavy reinforcements from North Africa arrived. So, this is part of why Basil was making sure that he had a good number of Varangians on hand, since these were the guys who were best at storming cities and also bringing about positive outcomes on the battlefield. Basil died between December 12th and 15th, and when news of his death arrived, this caused the invasion to end. Boioannes retreated to Italy, where he would continue on as Catapano for several more years, and so far as I'm aware, Orestes disappeared into the mist. I imagine for the leaders of the Emirate of Sicily, this was quite a relief. For the Byzantine world, however, it was anything but. In 1025, when he died, Basil II was 66 or 67 years old. We're assuming he was born around 958. And a man who had always had a somewhat severe temperament had not seen his mood improve due to the passage of time. A young Michael Pacellus, his later biographer, met him when he was a small child, and he recounts that Basil was very cranky about having kids running around at court and that he got yelled at. Basil was known to yell at many people, and he tended to be extremely autocratic in his personal demeanor. In December, while he was making his preparations for the Sicilian campaign, Basil fell ill, and this time this, the illness was different, and he knew that the end was near. He called in his brother, Constantine VIII, from the suburbs. The brothers seemed to have had some tension between them by this point. And he asked his brother to make sure that he was buried near the church of St. John the Theologian. This was an unusual request, as most emperors were buried at churches nearer to the center of the city. St. John the Theologian was a military mustering ground, or at least was near a military mustering ground some seven miles from the heart of the city. And this was the spot from which armies would begin triumphs when they marched into the city. No more fitting a resting place could be imagined for someone like Basil II, who after all did spend 
the majority of his reign on campaign. Constantine VIII, for his part, was determined to be a good brother and made sure that it went exactly as Basil had wished. The image you see here is a sarcophagus which was recovered in 1914 and which was originally thought to be a sarcophagus for Basil II, but subsequent scholarship has shown that this was most likely much older from about the 5th century, so this had nothing to do with Basil whatsoever, but I found it interesting and decided to include it. By all appearances, many people in the Byzantine world didn't realize exactly what they had lost until a few years had passed. However, as Basil was succeeded by inferior men, it became apparent that he had truly been special and that Byzantium had been blessed to have him. Everyone soon recognized that he had been the greatest ruler that their empire had ever produced, and I guess they couldn't have known at the time, but he also would be the greatest ruler their empire ever would produce. As for his famous moniker, the Bulgar Slayer, this actually only emerges about a century or so after his death, but once the term was coined, it came to be universally associated with Basil II, and you can't really say Basil II without calling him Basil the Bulgar Slayer. He was legendary for his tireless work ethic, he had perseverance like no other, and he constantly produced victories of great consequence. Byzantium flourished under his rule and reached the apogee of its power. As such, the legend of Basil II is historically accurate. He's one of the few people whose legend is absolutely backed up by the historical record. So he has that going for him, and that's something that is quite impressive. As I mentioned earlier, it is my belief, and I don't think it is a terribly controversial belief, that Basil II is far and away the greatest of the Byzantine emperors. That being said, I think that we need to put his career into context and really think about what made him successful. When I try to view Basil objectively, it occurs to me that he very much was the beneficiary of the circumstances of his time and that he actually was not all that naturally talented. So let's explore that. We have to understand his full context. In his youth, the empire was sort of soft usurped by Nicephorus II Phocas and John I Zemiskis, both of whom were very capable rulers and commanders. They left the state in a great place when they died, and a young Basil inherited an empire that was in a great position and had a very strong army. He then had his relative Basil Acopinus, who also was very competent and conducted affairs well. He had many challengers early on, but as the heir to the Macedonian dynasty, he definitely held the advantage at all times. He was uniquely legitimate. He was, I believe, a fifth-generation ruler. This was a pretty rare thing in Byzantium to have five generations of the same house. His grandfather, Constantine VII, had been one of the great rulers, and his great-grandfather, or great-great-grandfather, excuse me, Basil I, had also done quite a, a bit. So for Basil II, he could claim to have a long heritage, and this was something that would always endear him to a huge percentage of his subjects. He achieved a great deal militarily. I think it's easy to say that he achieved more militarily than any other ruler, and it's not that close. However, it is worth noting that there is no evidence that Basil was anything close to a military genius. His victories came about due to diligence. He, As I said, he was an obsessive scouter after Trajan's Gate. He almost always had numbers. It appears that at any given time, especially when he was fighting Bulgaria, he had both the larger and higher quality army. And the Varangian Guard, once he acquired that, became the chief tool that he relied upon to bring victory. So, although Basil achieved a great deal, it was not because of talent so much as application and resources. And this does not take away from what he achieved, but we have to understand that if we were to drop him into a vacuum where, say, he had only an average army, we would be foolish to expect him to start performing like the Bulgar Slayer. 
it was only in the context of his time that he was able to achieve what he did. If someone of his harsh temperament had emerged in a different period as ruler, then he might well have ended up being a great deal more like Justinian II than what he ended up like. The empire was very prosperous at this time as well. Not only did the empire hold a lot of territory, but things were generally going well economically. They were bringing in a lot of revenue. Harvest were good. We don't hear about any real famines or anything like that in Basil's time. So he was able to afford enormously expensive wars and, by the way, also still fill up the treasury to the point that he actually had to expand it. So the empire was at its absolute peak and Basil took advantage of it. In many ways, he's kind of the beneficiary of the work of his predecessors, the way that Alexander the Great is the beneficiary of Philip II's reforms and the development of the Macedonian state. He also had the advantage of longevity. That is something that we should never underestimate. The longer you get the rule, the more you can accomplish. Or if you're a bad ruler, the longer you rule, the more you can really do long-term damage. Basil II came to power at a very young age, and then he got the rule autocratically for about 40 years. And in that 40-year period, as we've seen, he accomplished an amazing amount. Without having all 40 years, however, he would not have accomplished as much. And had he been granted, say, five more years, then he might very well have conquered Sicily, which would have been a conquest second only to his conquest of Bulgaria. So, again, I think that we have to keep all of this in mind. And I mentioned in my John Zemisky's video something that occasioned surprisingly little pushback that I believe John Zemisky's had more natural talent than Basil II. I still believe that after having studied Basil II in detail. Zemisky's was a much better politician and, so far as I can tell, was a better general as well. Nicephorus Phocas was a better general than Basil, but he was a horrible administrator and not much of a politician, so I think Basil has him beat in terms of natural talent. So anyway, those are just my thoughts. Um, as you all know, who have watched this channel for a while, I don't go in for hero worship, and I do try to always look at people as fairly as possible and put them into the proper historical context. In 1025, when he died, Basil II left Byzantium in fantastic shape. Not only were the treasuries full, but he had added a great deal of territory, revenue, and manpower to the empire. His standing armies were strong, and he had a number of capable commanders in the field. However, one area that he neglected, which would come to haunt the empire for the next 50 or so years, was the issue of the succession. He did not do hardly anything to make sure that the empire would be passed on to a strong successor who would be able to keep the success going. His brother Constantine VIII was nearly the same age, I think he was only two or three years younger, and he would only live for three years after taking the throne in 1025. Although Constantine VIII was a man in his mid-sixties, he had very little experience in government because Basil had basically frozen him out. Whenever you have an autocratic system, the personality of your ruler has a major importance. And in the case of Basil, his overbearing and paranoid nature had caused Constantine to largely withdraw from public life and to stay the hell out of government lest he attract his brother's envy or paranoia and wind up dead. So Constantine VIII had instead dedicated himself to something like pleasure, or at least a very quiet private life, and he really wasn't ready for the strains of the throne. Constantine VIII had three daughters, all of whom were unmarried, and all of whom were over the age of 40 in 1025. Basil could have insisted that his nieces get married earlier to have children. He also could have insisted that Constantine himself get remarried and have sons. Of course, we're leaving aside the possibility that Basil could get married himself. All of these things are options, and Basil pursued none of them. It's really inconceivable. No pun intended. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that while Basil's nieces still had some life left in them as women who were between about 40 and 45, 
The problem is that in antiquity, or at least the Middle Ages in this case, women did not remain fertile into their 40s on a regular basis. One exception to this is Eleanor of Aquitaine, who had King John at the age of 42. But for the most part, women were menopausal and past their childbearing years by the time they were in their 40s. So the Macedonian dynasty was running on a ticking clock, and there was very little possibility of renewal at this point. The dynasty would linger on until 1056, but I think you can make an argument that for all practical intents and purposes, it died with Basil II on December 15, 1025. I would also like to say that I believe, and I guess I'll test this as we move forward, but it is my impression that up until the Battle of Manzikert, Byzantium is in something of a post-Basil hangover where it's still succeeding and doing well, but where the empire is just kind of in a holding pattern and things are kind of being neglected while a lot of the surface, uh, while on the surface level, it's still very great and doing well. But those are just my preliminary thoughts. We will test those as we move forward and study the reigns of Basil's various successors. So his brother and then the various husbands of his nieces. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian. Remember to like, comment, share, subscribe, and all of that other shit that every YouTuber tells you to do. Peace out.